morning we have heard a nice presentation on on the effect of cobalt particle size in fission top synthesis. I want to present a similar study that we did a while ago um, on supported iron-based fission torch catalysts. The background, of course, being that in order to obtain a high activity, um, we want to uh, provide a high metal surface area. And this you can achieve, of course, by using small crystallites. However, it has been reported, and we've seen this this morning a couple of times, that small cobalt crystallites, and they'll be smaller than four to six, nanometers are inactive during fissure top synthesis and there are a couple of reasons that have been put forward or explanations such as oxidation, formation of irreproduc irreducible compounds with oxidic support material, even the presence of oxidic phases in the vicinity of metal and decoration of support moieties um, have been mentioned as reasons. Now in this study we want to focus on iron crystallites and the activity and stability um, and selectivity in fischer torch synthesis. Uh, the big challenge is, of course, that we need a, a number of good model catalysts for this study. Um, with narrow crystallite um, distributions. Plus, we want to be able to control the crystallite size. So we want to be able to tune the average crystallite size and, at the end of the day, have a large range of uh, model catalysts with different average crystallite sizes. Now, we made use of water in oil microemulsion system. A water in oil microemulsion is a thermodynamically stable isotropic dispersion of aqueous phase in a continuous oil phase. So we're dealing with small water droplets, this is the aqueous phase, surrounded by a surfactant phase in an oil phase continuum. Where are we in the, in the ternary plot? Um, we're sitting in this corner here, in the oil-rich corner. This is where reverse micelles um, are present. Um, we have water, in our case oil is, we use N-hexane throughout our study, and a non-ionic surfactant, pentaethylene glycol dolisyl ether. Now it is known that just by changing the composition of these three components, we can dial the size of the reverse micelle. And we intend to make use of this reverse micelle as a reaction vessel, where we are manufacturing our uh, nanoparticles. How do we do that? We prepare a number of, um, of um, uh, microemulsions with different uh, compositions and we, we prepare them in duplicate, one of which contains iron nitrate in the aqueous solution and the other one contains a precipitate, namely ammonium carbonate in the, in the aqueous solution. Those are the uh, concentrations of the, of the salts that we used in this study. We then combine these two microemulsions and let them react. So these, these reverse micelles, they, there's mass um, exchange taking place and eventually we have precipitation happening in the confined space of these uh, reverse micelles. Uh, we leave this under steering at 25 degrees for three hours and at, at that point the precipitation normally uh, should have come to, a, to an end. Um, we then add acetone in order to break up these micelles and remove the surfactant from the, from the precipitate. After this, we dry the material um, in air at 300 degrees for 16 hours, um, applying a temperature program. The resulting crystallites, and these are not, this is non-supported material, is shown here. Uh, so we were able to, to manufacture um, crystallites with average sizes ranging from between two nanometers up to 16 nanometers. The sample codes that you see there indicate the quantities of chemicals that we used, namely 5 grams of iron, 58 grams of surfactant, and 250 grams of um, N-hexane in this case. For those of you in the back, I'm going to blow up two of these pictures. Um, in this case, we kept the uh, amount of surfactant and oil constant, and we only increased the amount of water phase uh, in the, in the micro-margins. In doing so, we were able to increase the average particle sizes from 4 to 14 nanometers. The um, PM evaluation is shown here. I'm only giving the, the, the ratios or the quantities of water and surfactant from now on. Um, so by increasing the water to surfactant ratio, we obtain an increase of the average crystallite size, and the uh, um, crystallite size distribution is still uh, sufficiently narrow for the study that we anticipate. We confirmed these crystallite sized trends here with XRD analysis. 
uh, the, the corresponding plots are shown in this series here. The major phase present was Fe203. And as we go from the top to the bottom, we see that we uh, have line broadening. So this indeed confirms that the crystallites are smaller in those samples. Just to sum up this, this work on the non-supported material, I'm showing the average crystallite sizes as a function of the water to surfactant weight ratio. This is the XRD work. This is the, that we also did BT, BT uh, characterization of the non-supported material. And this is the TEM work. And indeed, we find more or less a linear increase of the crystallite sizes that we manufacture as we increase the uh, water disaffecting ratio. Now, that's all very nice, but we still don't have a, have a supported catalyst. So how do we go about this? We follow the exact same preparation procedure up to this point here. This is where we're adding our support material to the precipitate, which is still located in the, in the micelles. We do this for 30 minutes, and again, after this, we, we wash it with acetone, break up the, the micelles, and remove the uh, remove this effectant. Um, and this, is, this material is then again calcined. Uh, the catalysts that we prepared are as follows. We use two um, support materials, one carbon support and an alumina support. The carbon support is the high surface area carbon support with uh, average pore sizes of around two nanometers. Then we use the Sassel Germany alumina support uh, with 160 square meters per gram uh, surface area and an average pore size between 11 and 12 nanometers. The catalyst codes, obviously the C stands for carbon, A for alumina, and the number uh, after this uh, indicates the crystallite size that we anticipated based on the um, results from the, non from the preparation of the non-supported material. The iron loading in these catalysts was around 4 weight percent. These catalysts were promoted with um, typical amounts of potassium, namely 5 gram of potassium per 100 gram of iron. As I mentioned, it was calcined and prior the official hops runs, the catalysts were reduced at 350 degrees in pure hydrogen at one bar for 16 hours, again following a temperature ramp of one degree per minute. Those are the resulting, um, the, the supported catalysts that we manufactured. Um, on the left-hand side, you see the carbon material, two, two different sizes, two nanometers and 14 nanometers. On the right-hand side, this is the um, alumina supported material, again, two and 14. You can see that we get a, a fairly good distribution of the, of the material on the support. It was not so great with the, with the carbon supported material. Um, this is um, TM, those are TM pictures of reduced catalysts. So these catalysts were reduced and then passivated with CO2 at room temperature in order to um, protect it from oxidation. Um, we can see that with the, with the small crystallites of the carbon series, we do see some cluster formation happening here. But if you look, if you look close enough, you can still see the small crystallites present in those, in those clusters. That was somewhat better in, with the catalyst in the alumina series. We then evaluated those um, TM pictures as good as we could. Uh, this shows the particle size distributions that we obtained on the calcine material. And this is the particle size distributions that we obtained after, after reduction. So the, the, the crystallite size or the reductive pretreatment has not uh, changed the crystallite size much. So apparently there has not, we have not obtained much, much sintering here, which is good news. The same uh, trends we saw with the Illumina series. We have, have, have catalysts with crystallite sizes between 3 up to 90 nanometers before and after reduction is very similar. In order, in order to confirm this, we did some extra D analysis on the reduced and passivated catalyst, and this is shown here for the carbon series. One major peak, which corresponds to alpha, alpha ion, and as we go from the top to the bottom, we do indeed see line broadening, which corresponds to smaller crystallized presence in those samples down here. The same thing applies for the alumina-supported material. Again, we find line broadening and the confirmation of the, of the crystallite size trends that we obtained in the TEM work. Now then, we went back to the lab and um, put these um, catalysts to, to the test. In the carbon series, we used 0.5 gram of the catalyst material. In the alumina series, 0.2 gram of catalyst. This particle sizes that we used were between 100 and 150 micrometers. And we did dilute the material with uh, silicon carbide. 
as mentioned prior the reaction the catalyst was reduced in, in pure hydrogen at 350 degrees for 16 hours reaction conditions 270 <coughs> degrees 30 bar and a 2 to 1 hydrogen to uh, carbon monoxide ratio some activity results what I'm showing here is the total CO conversion as a function of time online on the logarithmic scale on the left hand side the carbon supported material and this is the alumina supported <coughs> catalyst the general or gen, the conversion levels in this case here were re between 40 and 60 or 70 percent and the general trend seems to be a deactivation of the material though there are some exceptions to to this now in the alumina series remember the space velocity was somewhat higher actually in fact 2.5 and as, as a consequence of this we're getting a lower conversion uh, the general trend again being a, a slight deactivation over time now in this plot I'm showing the formation of fischer topf product um, normalized for the metal surface area that we have present in the, cat in the reactor after, uh, after reduction and this was determined from the um, crystallite size distribution of the reduced material from TEM work and uh, it also includes the degree of reduction that we determined in a different, in a separate experiment. Now if we normalize it this way, we would not expect a, a or this would correspond to, uh, to a turnover frequency, this, uh, this number. Um, however, what we find here is that from a certain threshold value on, we find a more or less constant, constant activity uh, with both of these both of, both of these catalysts, whereas if, if you go be, below this threshold value, which seems to be somewhere between seven to eight nanometers, we find a, a decrease of this specific activity. So this confirms very nicely the, the trend that uh, Professor Brian Young has presented this morning on, on cobalt-based catalysts. Now this was um, 60 minutes time on stream data and the same applies throughout the run so we can do that after 10 minutes and this is now the 70 7000 minute data which is about five days time online you find the exact same trends here now we do not have an, an, have an explanation for this uh, what we propose um, is an analogy to what has been proposed in, in cobalt based catalysis is that small crystallites of the active phase namely iron carbides and iron might uh, transform into what is believed to be non-active, namely um, magnetite. Alternatively, we think it is safe to believe that a fischer hopsch site is not one atom only. Um, we might deal with certain ensembles of particles or atoms which, um, uh, which are needed in order to, to get fischer hopsch growth going. Now they might have a certain size and if we are just um, let's, uh, let's consider them to be of, of this size as depicted here. Now we, we would find a certain number on a, on a large of these ensembles on the large crystallites. If you go to smaller crystallites, the density of these ensembles would decrease, of course. Eventually you come to, you get to a crystallite size which is so small that there wouldn't even be one of these ensembles left and this crystallite would, there, would, would therefore be completely inactive. It's just our thoughts on that. Let's have a look on the on the selectivity there. All the selectivity data that I'm showing from now on uh, were collected at 60 minutes time on screen. First of all, methane. Methane is of course the simplest product of fischer topsch synthesis. There's no chain growth involved and uh, for methane production, what has even been proposed that there are sites different from that of chain growth for methane selectivity. If you look at the methane selectivity as a function of the crystallite size, we find a decrease with increasing crystallite size in both these series. Correspondingly, we find an increase of the chain growth probability, um, and I'm showing the chain growth probability which was derived from the, uh, from the slopes in the Anderson Schultz Flory distributions in the carbon number range C3 to C7. <coughs> these chain growth probabilities increase with increase of the crystallite size. Now again, it, it might be the case that chain growth is certainly more demanding than uh, the formation of of methane only um, and it is possibly more likely or that we have a larger density of chain growth sites on large crystallites as opposed to the fairly simple uh, methane formation sites. Now, um, 
the uh, an, an increase of chain growth probability and a decrease of uh, methane selectivity in iron-based fissure torch synthesis is often associated with uh, effects of potassium promotion. What we did in our study, we kept the amount of potassium promotion on our catalyst constant. Now, in doing so, with an increase of the of the of the crystallite size, we effectively increasing the potassium to metal surface area. Therefore, what we're seeing here might in fact also be due to effects of, of increasing potassium promotion. Potassium is also known to increase um, olefin formation in iron-based special pop synthesis. Now, olefins are the main primary products of fissure top synthesis, they can reabsorb and be hydrogenated to form paraffins or to initiate further chain growth. Now in order to express the extent of this uh, secondary reaction, we normally plot the molar contents of olefins in the linear fraction of the corresponding hydrocarbons as a function of carbon number. We did this for the carbon series and the alumina series. And with the carbon series, we find fairly low olefin contents indicative for a fairly large extent of secondary reactions happening on these catalysts. Uh, whereas with the alumina, you find olefin contents which are more typical to um, potassium promoted iron catalysts. Uh, we do not see a, a clear size trend or a crystallite size trend uh, in those two series. There's another secondary reaction which uh, olefins do undergo, and this is olefin isomerization. Alpha olefins can reabsorb and form olefins with internal double bonds. Now, in order to express the extent of this uh, reaction, we normally plot the, uh, the alpha olefin contents in the fraction of the linear olefins as a function of carbon number. With in absence of any uh, olefin isomerization, you would get 100% alpha olefins. Now, this is not what we're seeing with the with the alumina series. We find uh, <coughs> fairly high alpha olefin contents, which is which is to be expected in, in potassium promoted um, iron catalysts. However, with the with the carbon promoted catalysts, this these values are catastrophically low. Really, this, this is indicative for um, for iron catalysts where there's basically no potassium present. We therefore believe that the alumina series is to some extent hampered, or the evaluation of the of the of the data in the alumina series is to some extent hampered by the fact that we effectively increase the potassium to to a metal surface area. Whereas in the carbon series, um, the trends that we see might be a true reflection of the crystalline size and not due to effects of potassium promotion. Um, oxygenates, it's also known that oxygenates, or that potassium promotes the formation of oxygenates. And we do seem to see that within the alumina series. Whereas in the, in the, in the carbon series, where we again now think that uh, the potassium promotion does not play a role, and what we see here is a true reflection of the effects of, of crystallite size, we see an increase of the formation of oxygenates as we go to small crystallites. Now there are at least two mechanisms that have been put forward for the, uh, to explain the formation of oxygenates, one of which entails the insertion of CO um, into an alkyl group in order to form this oxygen-containing oxygen intermediate, which after desorption would form an alcohol and an aldehyde. Um, now we propose that it is possible, or these, these um, reactions of CO insertions are known to preferably occur on sites with low coordination, which should be present in larger quantities um, on the one at, at higher concentrations in the small crystallites on the edges and the, uh, the corners. Another reaction that we in investigated was the, the chain branching. Um, in the alumina series, and again, potassium is known to force back chain branching, getting less branched products with potassium promotion, and this, we again, to see this in the alumina series. Whereas with the carbon series where we think there is no, no hampering effect here and this, is, this shows us the effect of crystallite size, we find a, a, almost no trend of the iso2n iso ratio in the C5 fraction. To sum up, uh, we've successfully prepared a number of model type catalysts and uh, via the precipitation in oil and water and oil microemulsions. Uh, small crystallites uh, show it to be less active than the big ones. 
and we think or we propose it might be due to oxidation of small crystallites or lower density of fission formed prop ensembles in those small crystallites. As for the selectivity, in the Illumina series, we think there might be a problem with the potassium promotion here. Whereas in the carbon series, we do not think that this is the case, and therefore the decrease of the methane selectivity, the increase of chain growth, and the decrease of the oxygenate formation might indeed be due to effects of crystallite size. I would like to thank the University of Cape Town, the NRF and TRIP, uh, and you for your attention. It's not the, the degree of reduction in these samples is not 100 percent. It's between 70 and 80 percent. So it's not surprising that some magnetite is showing up in some of those samples. Yes. Have you, um, you know, I think the, the issue of small particle size and the, the obviously possibility of oxidation and whatever. But have you also thought about the possibility that as you decrease the particle size, it's well known from among the synthesis about the change in the facets exposed to different uh, planes. And since uh, it's also known that a lot of um, uh, impurities or poisons or promoters or whatever preferentially like to go to certain planes as opposed to others. Mm -hmm. um, you obviously have plat uh, potassium in here, but I wonder also about other impurities, either in the uh, activated carbon or even in the alumina. Yeah. I, I don't remember offhand your locks what all the impurities yeah. are there. Mm -hmm. But I mean, could you, have you thought about trying to explain some of, some of what's going on by particle size effects on either the acceptance or non-acceptance non yeah. of promoters. Well, you did a little bit of that, but uh, yes, the impurity. Yeah, we have not thought about this much yet, but what strikes me is that um, the grain of the, of the crystallites of different sizes is very similar on both, um, on both materials. And so far, I do not believe that impurities or anything like this will play a big role. Yeah. Uh, about 1990, uh, Ramos Warren and, uh, and I published a paper uh, where Ramos Warren had studied uh, uh, iron on alumina catalysts that had been prepared uh, with decomposition of carbonyls on highly dehydroxylated support so that the OH concentration was low. And in that case, we were able to see uh, no change in activity up to about, uh, oh, I, I think 30, 40 percent dispersion, 35 to 40 percent. Yeah. And uh, we concluded that like cobalt and, and uh, nickel and ruthenium, have been shown to have no crystallite size effect, or at least uh, they're not structure sensitive reactions. Uh, we, we can that it was just that when we did get it and when we didn't properly dehydroxylate the support, then we would get a loss of activity and we concluded that was due to metal support interactions and, or metal oxide support interactions yeah. which are very strong. Yeah.